Hey everyone, before we dive into this video, I want to give a quick shout out and some love to our good friends over at Sneak. If you haven't heard, Sneak is hosting a free Capture the Flag, or what they're calling a Fetch the Flag, on October 5th. The CTF is for beginners to intermediate players, and I've actually included a couple of my own original old school vintage challenges. There will be 20 challenges in total, including a few that I created. So hey, if you win, in addition to the glory and bragging rights that you can take home, you can win some awesome prizes, including a Nintendo Switch. It's all totally free, it's all online, and you can register right now with the link in the description below. You're gonna have my little tag in there, sneak.co slash John. And take a look, have some fun, it should be a great game, it's going to be beginner friendly and welcoming to just about all players and levels of expertise. Solve some challenges, learn some cool new things, and I'm going to be doing write-ups of course, I'm going to be showcasing some video write-ups and solutions after the capture of the flag, but if you want to get the most out of it, you should totally jump in, go play, and try your hand yourself. The CTF kicks off on the first day of SneakCon, Sneak's conference on building securely. So participate in the CTF on October 5th. And then stick around on October 6th and 7th for 100 sessions and more, including some live hacking workshops. Totally free, all online, virtual. You can register right now. Link in the description below. And I hope to see you there. Hope to see you on the scoreboard. And I hope to see you soon. Hello everyone and welcome back to another Malware Analysis YouTube video. I'm pretty excited to bring this one to you because I think this is an interesting little uh, task here. I've gotten halfway through the portion of the analysis. I want to show you this, this nice trick and then the actual like quote-unquote reverse engineering or walking through the sample I have not yet done. So there will be a little bit of a uh, tiptoe tap dancing, a little bit of improv. Don't exactly know where I'm going. It's going to be exploratory, going to be discovery-based, and we're going to have some fun. But I think this is an interesting one because there's a little bit of a problem, a slight snag, and then a, a cool resolution that I think some of you are probably already familiar with or others might not be. So without further ado, I think we're already like, what, a minute into the intro? Let's get after it. I'm over here here on my computer screen. Uh, I should be working in Remnux for a Linux distribution to kind of reverse engineer and do this analysis, but I am just in my Ubuntu VM at the moment. Please forgive me, internet overlords. And let's see what we're up against. I'm in this directory called reg using Z shell and with Z shell syntax highlighting using exa to display ls contents in a nice, beautiful way. Uh, and I've got a couple files here. I've got the original command that was ran and another interesting file we'll talk about in just a moment. But let me give you a little bit more background and pre tense here. The original command was found being executed on a victim host set up as an auto run, right? Set up as kind of a persistent foothold, set up as an implant or little backdoor to kickstart more code just on startup automatically an auto run, right? That original command was originally, I think, just an LNK file or a Windows shortcut file, and it tucked in more code that we will take a look at right here. I'll go ahead and cat out this original command. And the syntax that we see is invoking command prompt, cmd.exe, uh, slash C to invoke one singular command as an argument to this command prompt window we're kickstarting, and we'll start a new process. Now, the color syntax highlighting gets a little bit messy because there are lots of quotes and weird minified compressed data here, right? It's obviously all just one big long line, uh, but we're using quotes here to note the string of the process that we will start through the command prompt. We're using MSHTA. Now, MSHTA is that engine and interpreter and program built in native inherent to Windows that will execute other scripting languages kind of used with the HTML application stuff that Microsoft has. Uh, so it'll be able to run JavaScript or JScript, Windows dialect rendition of JavaScript, or Visual Basic Script, VB Script, um, and other weird things. You can see it used a ton if I go ahead and, and Google up to lolbins MSHTA. And there we go, and just fire that up. You can see used by Windows to execute HTML applications, MSHTA, MSHTA in the default paths, and uh, a lot of good reading and research already done, but you could really be hunting for this sort of thing, trying to detect it by using raw or obfuscated scripts within the command line. You could have it execute an HTA file on its own, or you could pass in more code as a command line argument, just as we're seeing being used here, MSHTA.exe, with a language and syntax to be used, Visual Basic Script or JavaScript, 
And you could also do some spooky, scary stuff with alternate data streams, uh, adding things with a colon after a file and other neat tricks. Uh, so if you haven't heard of Lobins, other incredible resource. If you haven't heard of MSHTA, other thing to uh, explore and take a look at. But I think that's enough <laughs> top cover on that idea. I'm sure you are more interested in the syntax here. We're running JavaScript, and it uh, looks like we're setting some weird variable names, O, N, K, D, Q, Q7, totally random, to the letter N. <laughs> U6, Q being set to a new ActiveX object to run a wscript.shell. Okay, could be doing some nefarious stuff there pretty soon. And then some other variables being set to other random strings. Uh, and then taking the object that was set to wscript.shell and reading from the registry. And we reg read or read from the registry in the hive h key cu or h key current user. We reach into a software, little key, and then a sub key, uh, random letters, random letters <laughs> as the final value there. Also setting other weird strings to nonsense, also setting other weird strings to nonsense. But ultimately, we end up evaling and executing code that's going to be present in that registry key. Let me go ahead and clean this. Let's copy that original command to like a stage one. Uh, I guess we'll call it .js because it is going to be running JavaScript after all. Let's open that up and I could turn on word wrap to make this a little bit easier for us to see. Super duper zoom in here and let's cut out everything up until executing JavaScript because we know we are just going to end up running JavaScript in this file. Adding new lines after each semicolon, just doing this by hand manually because there isn't a whole lot to do. <laughs> like that was what, seven lines? Um, let's go ahead and save this, uh, maybe a copy of it. We'll call it cleaned stage one. And I guess we can start to rename some of these variables. Let's call this the letter N, not reuse anywhere else. Uh, U6Q is going to be a representation of W script shell. Um, and then we have another random cares, another one for more cares, and then another one for other cares. Super easy. Uh, so I was using control alt H, or excuse me, I used, used control H in sublime text to enter, find, and replace. And then I hit control alt enter on my keyboard to find and replace all occurrences. Just some nonsense that I use here. Um, code from registry. Oh, makes it a little bit too big to read. So ultimately, aside from some weird random strings that aren't used whatsoever in this snippet here, we're just grabbing more data being stored in the Windows registry and then executing it with the eval statement. So there could be dangerous stuff going on. It's just a matter of knowing what is in that registry key. Now, if you're doing this in sort of a actual investigation or just kind of responding and trying to figure out what this might do or doing the analysis uh, in uh, an environment, right? You could very well be working with an EDR product, endpoint detection response, or some sort of incident response agent, uh, GRR, right? GRR, I think, that, I think that's Google wrapper response. I could be wrong. Um, but oftentimes you might have a utility to be able to look for and search for these in one specific way where you're running as system. You have the ultimate godlike powers. Uh, oftentimes, when you're checking out HKCU or the current user, you run into this problem where you're only going to be able to see the users that might be logged in because HKCU is not going to be relative to your running account system. I don't know if I explained that in a very good way. Uh, let's grab a Windows virtual machine and kind of show you what I'm feeling here. I'll fire up regedit, right, for a registry editor. And forgive me, I might have some stuff left over to clean here, but hkey current user only refers to your user that you have, or you're currently running as, right, current user. Uh, there is H key users, which you might be able to actually reference and explore different users' current user key if you knew their SID or their user identifying number, right? S, TAC1, TAC5, et cetera, et cetera, and then a random string here, uh, 
I don't, I don't think good is the right word for that, but that identifier for it, Sid is the right word for that realistically for that user. If you were to navigate in H key users under that user's Sid, you could explore what would be in that user's current user hive and key. The hard part is if you are running a system and you don't have visibility on H key current user, you're relying on this H key users hive, but you'll only be able to see things potentially if that user is logged in or their user profile has been loaded. What I'm getting at is that I was kind of blind to what was living in HKCU, HK current user software, this weird, that weird. And I wasn't going to be able to see what this spooky, scary code was doing, what this malware might be trying to execute and run. That was the problem. That was the issue there is that I didn't have the visibility into HKCU. Now that I've beaten the dead horse, let's talk about the solution. I try to do a little bit of research on this. I try to Google around, you know, as you should. Uh, we could get back into Chrome. We could be Googling for like view other users HKCU or, or current user registry hive. Um, and you might be able to see some super user tricks. And this is exactly what I ended up learning. And I would like to bring to you in case you don't already know this trick. It is literally just manually loading a user's key. I'm looking for a way to access the registry of another user on a computer so I can copy and work with that. The idea is that I'm trying to get a blah, blah, blah background they don't need. Uh, I don't know the other user's password, so I can't log in as them or do a run as. And maybe this is the scenario you might find yourself in, is if you're doing that incident response, you're working with some IR agent, uh, and you're in this situation, what you could do is swipe that user's ntuser.dat file. And I'm sure you saw that in my current directory there. That's located in user profile. And that in essence is their H key current user hive. Uh, that of course requires you to be admin or system and have access to that have file. Uh, but if you're doing memory analysis, if you're doing forensics, maybe you might find that situation. Uh, let's get back to my Windows VM and I'll show you that kind of an action. I will open up a command prompt here and I am in currently my user profile. I'll show you that variable super quick. Yep, just the current directory, the home directory equivalent in Windows here. And I could run a DIR or check to see if ntuser.dat really exists in here. Uh, I think I need to do like a slash A to show all files. Yeah, there it is because uh, that is hidden in a system file by default. So dir slash a nt user dot dat. It could very well be a decently large file, couple megs, maybe four megabytes, six megabytes. I think, I think at the most I've seen is six megabytes so far, but uh, you could swipe this file, grab it, and then start to play with it and work with it. I could open this up and load it within regedit, kind of like I had just read previously. You can see I actually have done this and I have a little leftover <laughs> that I feel bad about. I have an apples thing that I tried to load in. Because if you do this within regedit, if you were to try and click on a hive, go into file, and you'd want to load a hive, you might have saw a comment in that super user post that said, uh, load hive will only be visible and accessible for you if you are in H key users or H key current user. Uh, I believe it's just actually H key users. So now if I were to load Hive, I could get to where I would have stored that ntuser.dat file. I'll open that up and it looks like it already has been loaded, which makes sense because it's in that apples thing here. I don't know if I can unload that. I tried to delete it, but it was like, nah, I don't want to do it. Um, oh, unload Hive. Yeah, do that. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> now back to HK users, load Hive. Let's pull in that ntuser.dat file and it'll ask for a name or like just a nickname that you want to refer to this hive as within your local registry editor. It's not the actual name of something within that on the, on the actual machine. It's just your local testing copy. So uh, you could say I literally called it apples. You could call it whatever. We could call it please subscribe. Um, I'll call it test, just nice and easy. And it will load in. 
and then you could navigate and look around it. Uh, I'm not going to end up showcasing this uh, in all its entirety because of confidentiality reasons, right? But I think this gives us a little bit more runway and because we could work with this. The hard part is that if we're viewing this in the registry, there could very well be a lot of locations and lots of huge, ginormous chunks of code and payloads and data that we can't readily copy out of regedit like by hand. You could, right? You could do it manually, but it might just suck. So let's automate it in a different way or try to get it so we could copy and paste things out in a, in a sane way to do that. That brought me to this next conversation and not brought me to this next talking point where if we have this ntuser.dat file, how can we carve out all the data and information in a way we could use it on Linux, right? Because I was in Windows, but I really want to do my analysis in Linux because I'm a Linux guy. Uh, so you could be Googling around for registry, extract, tool, command line, or things like that, trying to look for things. Obviously, Reg Ripper is a great discussion and talking point. Maybe a Reg Ripper would work really well for us. Um, I think one that I wanted to get into was trying to do stuff with, with Python because maybe I'd want to automate this or, or do more with it in the future. Uh, so I would Google around for registry extract tool how about Python, um, pure Python parser for Windows registry hives, registry extraction, WinReg. There's plenty of these. Uh, the one that I stumbled across was Regipy, and I think I really like that one. If you'd like, totally feel free to explore a couple of these. Uh, this looks actually really, really similar to the same sort of syntax that I had seen in Regipy, but totally Google around, totally explore, uh, maybe see what they offer you or what they don't offer you. Um, but I would, I would, I would encourage you to explore if you wanted to. Let's dive into Regipy though, because Regipy would work really well for me. And that's the one that I had played with thus far. You can install it super easy, pip install Regipy. And it is a Python library for parsing offline registry highs. Exactly what we need right here. You can use it as a Python library if you'd like, or you could use some command line tools. You can dump an entire registry hive to JSON. Uh, and I'll show you that. Let's see. Uh, if I were to pip3 install regipy, I already have it installed, but you could run that command to get your hands on it yourself if you'd like to. And then you should have a couple new commands in the command line, right? They're not strictly all called regipy. If I were to try and run regipy on its own, it's like, uh, I don't know what that is. Sorry, dude. But if I tab complete, just hit tab a little bit, it'll t offer some examples for me or some options. I could use registry diff or registry dump or list plugins or parse header or all these things. And you could see these are a bit more defined in the uh, Regipy GitHub and the documentation there. Installation discussion, the command line tools, you can parse headers and see some nice tabular output or you can dump an entire hive to the disk. Uh, this might take a little bit of time. And that's what I was originally doing, right? I could just run registry dump, registry dump on that ntuser.dat file. Now I'm not gonna do that because again, I don't want that all to be displayed out on the screen. Maybe I could just snuff it and move it to like dev null or something. Uh, but that would literally, as the description in the readme had explained, take a long time because uh, it's, dumping out everything in a JSON format. Uh, maybe you just want to specifically narrow down to the registry key that you were looking at. Our HKCU software, et cetera, et cetera. Now that we could dive into HKCU with ntuser.dat, we could reach this. We could access the data that's there. Let me pull that out using Regipy as a library, kind of as it suggested in Python syntax. You can see it offers a lot of this here. You can initiate the registry hive object from regipy.registry import registry hive and grab all this. Uh, I, I could copy and paste that, but I know that I would get scolded from the YouTube comment trolls. I don't know if, I, don't, I honestly don't think I even would. I'm just making that up as an excuse for me to type it and feel better about myself. <laughs> but, uh, Registry hive, let's do a dot slash on our nt user dot dat. Um, does that have, no, it doesn't, it doesn't have dat in capital letters. 
So they literally use this exact example as well. If you check it out, they're using an ntuser.dat file that's loaded in. And you could iterate recursively over the entire hive, or maybe we could do some other neat stuff. Uh, you can see the syntax here with a reg object created, we can get a key or get sub keys and iterate through sub keys. So let me do that. Let me go ahead and reg get key. We'll use software. And just for a sanity check, let's just print this out on the screen to see that it works and runs for us. I'm using control B and sublime text to be able to run that kind of on the fly. Looks like it does return an object for me. So I know that that had succeeded, it got something. But now let's try and get a sub key of this thing, <laughs> R-N-V-T-T-Q-B-R-N, that really weird uh, sub key there. We know we're gonna be working in H key say you to begin with, it, it is that hive specifically, so we could just use software as part of the path uh, to retrieve that. Let me make that a, a separate screen that you can see. Yeah. So as we get software, now we'll get the sub key, RNI, et cetera. And let's display that out on screen. We've retrieved that object, nice and easy. And now we could get a specific value. That should be that thing. Let's get value. That look like, I think, uh, some syntax we could use here. Get the values of a key, scrolling over to the right here. Yeah, you could get values, plural, or can we just get a singular value? Get value, that guy. And let's display that out on the screen. <laughs> okay. So see, exactly, that is why I didn't want to do this in regedit purely, because there could be a crap ton of data and lots of stuff that you wouldn't easily be able to copy and paste out of that graphical user interface. I am going to get values, just as the documentation had suggested. Um, and let's see what else is in here. <laughs> what looks like base 64, right? Um, what looks like random characters that don't make sense, but this is obviously a lot more data. You can see my, my vertical scroll bar over on the right here. There's a lot of stuff. So we have this experiment.python script now to be able to carve out data. Let's try and get the value that we just saw previously. Um, before I do that, I suppose let's grab all of the values and then run it. There's that all. Let's redirect that to like an output.log file just so we have it. Uh, and then we can use this utility as a little bit more of a scalpel to get the value for specific um, registry values. It looks like all of this is literally just returning the value itself though, right? Yes, okay, so I'm not seeing any other tags like the name or the timestamp or the registry type, et cetera. All of this is, is just the reg value that we wanna see. Uh, with that said, we have this <laughs> pulled out and extracted for us. So now that we're over 20 minutes into the video and we've covered enough of the background here, laid the foundation to be able to extract out the data that this malware might even use, now we can get into the analysis and we'll see where we go. I haven't gone down this road yet. So this might, this is uncharted territory for me. If I fail more than usual, please forgive me. <laughs> we'll call that stage two.js if I could type. And stage two is going to still have some of the variables that were present in stage one. So we defined letter N in random characters as things that were kind of loaded before we run this eval statement, even more characters. Uh, so we should take their original variable name and see if they're used or referenced in this next stage. Uh, before we do that, let's word wrap all this and let's try to automate cleaning this up. I'll use a uh, find and replace yet again to replace any colon or semicolon to indicate a, the end of a line or end of a command with a new line character, right? So. Now we can see we have a couple other variables. 
set as strings of randomness. This looks like base64, but I don't exactly trust it. I don't know if this other variable is even going to be used anywhere else in the script. Uh, we have this giant chunk of data. <laughs> Seriously, this is, this is a huge chunk of data. Uh, maybe we could just ignore for the moment as we kind of continue on and see what else this code does. Looks like we define lots of other randomness, uh, an empty string, and then we start a for loop, which it looks like I broke while I was trying to use the uh, semicolon find and replace. I don't see a curly brace following this for loop, so I think it's just going to end up running one command. Um, we could go ahead and just add a new line for that so that's displayed and visible. Uh, and then another chunk of defining other random strings, yet another new line character, or uh, uh, sorry, empty string, and then another for loop. And this one actually does have a curly brace. So it looks like there's gonna end up being multiple uh, lines of code in this. We start to work with things, looks like do an XOR, have another uh, semicolon, and uh, we add stuff to it. Okay, okay, and then we eventually eval that new payload. Okay, so we've hidden something else in here. But all of these random strings, these variables are not used. <laughs> uh, so so let's, we should realistically name this to a cleaned stage two. I, I, I seriously don't think we're going to end up using these. So we could base64 decode the data like if we wanted to, but it's not going to be anything worthwhile. Like I, I really have the hunch this is just a rabbit hole. Yeah, completely garbage data. None of these are used. So probably just trying to make a noise, add it to the problem, uh, and make see if we can hide from antivirus or automated detection stuff like that but we could nerf some of that out we are using uh new line or empty strings though to add in different syntax though and i actually think this is used that has a longer length than others and you can see as i click on it it is highlighting other variables here so something this looks like it's being used as a maybe an xor key is kind of in the mix here but all this other stuff Nonsense. Complete garbage. Kind of a waste of time there. With that said, we should grab the original uh, variables that were defined here. This guy being the letter N. Do you think that's even going to be used though? No. Maybe those other ones will be used later. We don't know. But we can keep track of those variables that were defined previously and used. Let's set that up, actually. U6Q. Realistically, we should take this whole payload. I'll, I gotta be honest. And then we can try and cut this up on our own. The red read, though, I don't think we'll need, but it might be worthwhile to use and keep track of. So... With that said, let's go ahead and work with uh, <laughs> this thing. Looks like it's doing some XOR, and this is, of course, JavaScript, which means we can just let Node run this for us, execute this for us. We could just let this run without letting the eval statement detonate or execute the next layer of code, the next stage here. So let's take a, um, I guess, testing stage two. And rather than eval, let's go ahead and console.log this final variable that's displayed out here. Uh, I don't think there's anything else that's malicious here. Okay, no, no, this, this eval is still present. Uh, we also wouldn't be able to execute that new ActiveX object or run this red read because I'm running on Linux and Node.js won't know what to do with that. Those are specific to JScript and Windows. I think this is totally set to be ran with Node. So we have this uh, testing stage two now and let's try and run it now that we've 
declawed the thing and defanged the thing to not execute things with eval. I just want to see what the next layer of code would be that's going to end up being passed to eval. We got something. Ooh, I see some PowerShell usage in here. Whoa, we're going everywhere. Uh, <laughs> all right, let's redirect this to stage three dot js um and let's open that up and see what we're up against it's word wrap yet again let's try and clear out the semicolons <laughs> some new random variables and oh boy this does not look fun at all oh actually wait a second you know what maybe this isn't all that bad more random strings we try to move the window we try to resize it we get a new active x object being w script dot shell and we grab the environment pros an environment variable is that what that does Process, O E O E. Wait a second. O E L C X X. Is that something that's present in the registry or in the processes that we would have seen? Let's open up that log file that we had. Oh God, this is horrendous. Um, the OELCXXH is not present in what we would have seen in the registry, but it looks like it's just being set to PowerShell syntax and trying to execute some big base64 code. We would have to go ahead and remove. Uh, once that is ran, we go ahead and run C Windows PowerShell, PowerShell IEX, the environment. Okay, so it's just setting up some abstraction uh, to hide this code and not store it on the file system. That's actually very clever. That, I think that's kind of a neat trick in the whole fileless malware buzzword, right? We have not written to disk other than that simple, um, well, excuse me, we, we sort of have between the original auto run LNK file and of course the registry thing that we were able to retrieve from the file system <laughs> with ntuser dot dat. But this actual malicious payload, nah, dude. It's tucked away. It's hidden. So we've got PowerShell code here now. We're going to IEX and execute this text encoding ASCII get string from base64, all of that. And then we go ahead and execute it with IEX. Uh, with that said, we know that this is new PowerShell code to run. So let's call that, I guess, stage 3a.ps1. Um, and let's make sure word wrap is on. We don't have a eval statement or an IEX or invoke expression here, but we are going to end up displaying this code out. So how many parentheses are going to be in there? Two, it looks like. No, three, three. So let's tack in those three and let's see if this will run. With a, with a closing single quote, just like they have it. Sorry, my face was probably in the way. I was looking at how they ended this. So, once again, we could just use PowerShell to run stage 3a.ps1. Um, and I don't know if that will output anything on its own. It did. That it did. Okay, so we're doing more weird stuff. <laughs> Let's redirect that to stage 4.ps1 because now we've shifted to PowerShell. We got a new layer of code here. And this looks awful, but has a lot of random comments. We sleep for 15 seconds. And then we try to define a couple functions. Now, all of these function names, I don't know if you can see them, gdelegate and gproc, these look like boilerplate structures and building out the functionality uh, to be able to run Win32 API functions. 
uh, where we could try and get a delegate, get a type, get a, a, a process and do weird things. And oh, uh, maybe we'll execute shellcode. Oh, some of this looks broken. No. We have gproc to get proc address. Yep, that's literally the command. It's literally the Win32 function that we're running, trying to get a procedure. Um, get delegate would return the types for us. And all of these bytes looks like shellcode SC, SC32. All of this here is shellcode that would be executed. Looks like we try to get delegate for function pointer to find the proc address gproc for virtual alloc so we can allocate memory. And then we use get delegate for function pointer mem set so we can make sure that that is going to be writable and executable and all that. And then we try and create thread to execute code after we copy all of the shell code into that allocated memory address. Spooky. How many? Oh, oh no, no, no. That th the for loop is just for the mem set, and then we try and catch an exit. So we have shell code, except some of it is broken with some weird representation, and that really bums me out. It's not null bytes. It's just weird stuff. Is that something that PowerShell like knows how to handle? Can I get can I get into PowerShell super quick? Let me uh, change the profile so it looks like I'm in PowerShell and you know it. No. If I define these bytes, will it kind of know what I mean? I just took the first line of bytes because it looks like that does include this BK and KJ broken one. I, I truthfully just don't know what I'm looking at right now. Will that work regardless? I mean, it, I mean, it might. <laughs> I mean, it might do it. 0x8b? That's the 139. And what would have been, so 5.7 is 8.7, 5.6 is 8.6, 5.3 is 8.3. And what would have been KJ in that weirdness is, wait a second. Are those PowerShell comments? Am I just stupid? I'm pretty sure I'm just stupid. These are comments. <laughs> you guys are probably screaming at me the entire time, you stupid idiot. John. Okay. So we have shell code, and now we want to know what it does. Um, to try and figure out what this does, we could... Um, write a shellcode file on our own and then and, and and then just have like speakeasy try it. Let's let's try and get back to subble. Let's create a shellcode uh saver dot python file, I guess. Uh let's slap all this in here and let's remove anything within the stupid PowerShell comments. So those all get nerfed out. Okay, um, and then we can, I think, simply make this a byte array in, in Python. User bin environment Python 3. Um, so that was shell code 32. Let's try and import sys. So in Python 3, I could sys.centered.out.buffer.write to display that out onto the screen and maybe we could redirect it or save it. Realistically, we could just do a with open uh, SC32, write in bytes mode as 
Philp for file pointer. Philp dot write what would be called SC32. Maybe, maybe. Let's try and run this real quick. Finished. So now I have this SC32 file and it is supposedly data, but we know that it is shell code doing weird stuff. In fact, you can actually see a load. Uh, I don't know if you can see lib rary get proc address virtual alloc. So there's some spookiness in there. Maybe we could uh, actually see what this is doing with speakeasy. Um, I have to remind myself on the syntax for speakeasy just about every time I use it. So if you haven't heard of speakeasy before, I don't know if I've showcased it in a video. I, I feel like I might have at this point, but it's a portable modular binary emulator designed to emulate Windows kernel and user mode malware. Uh, instead of attempting to perform dynamic analysis using entire virtualized operating system, we'll just emulate specific components of Windows and let you kind of see and figure out what shellcode might be doing. You could play with it uh, and, and do <laughs> neat stuff in Python. And I, realistically, we should do that since we just did some fun things um, in RegiPy. But if we were to emulate Windows 32 shellcode, Python 3 runs speakeasy, tack T for the shellcode binary, tack R, and then uh, tack A to specify the architecture as x86. Let's try it. We have opt speakeasy, run speakeasy. Let's go ahead and Python 3 that. And the syntax was tack T to specify the target, which should be our shellcode 32, and tack R and then tack uh, A and x86 for the architecture. Will this give me anything cool? I hope. No. <laughs> uh, 3.7? I don't even have that. 3.8? No. 3.9? Uh, maybe we can play with that a little bit more. I know we're about 40 minutes into the video, um, and I am distracted with other things, kind of beckoning my need. Uh, so I'm going to pause the recording for now, hopefully play with just for just a little bit more, um, and then I'll try to clear things back up and hopefully get uh, more luck with running Speakeasy. Hope to get back to you in just a little bit. Hi. Um, hello. If you can't tell by the uh, change of shirt, change of lighting, change of me, uh, it's been a day. It's been two days, actually, uh, and I got pulled away from working on this, trying to record it because I had to do some other obligations, um, and uh, now, at this point, I really want to offer some closure because I did tinker with it, I did play with it just a little bit more, and I wanted to include that in the rest of this video here. So please forgive me for the time travel, but let me show you really what else I kind of got started with and was tinkering here with the rest of that and trying to get Speakeasy to play nicely. Uh, gotta be honest. I never did end up getting speakeasy to work with our shell code. So remember, we had this uh, SC32 file. Um, it is just data because it is, of course, shell code that would be executed and, and kind of interpreted or really ran and, and executed on the fly. But when we tried to run it with speakeasy, we were getting a lot of errors. Now, uh, you could open this up in Ghidra, uh, you could mess with this, uh, uh, try to finagle it in, in Speakeasy, and uh, I was thinking, you know, okay, cool, uh, truthfully, let's just try <laughs> and do what every individual might if they're stuck in a bind, and I would recommend this to folks, uh, ask for help. Check in with your friends, check in with other uh, researchers, check in with other nerds and other geeks. So I will, uh, in, in full transparency, showcase a conversation that I had um, with Caleb, a good friend of mine, fellow geek, fellow nerd. A lot of folks that might watch this channel and watch some of the stuff that I do already know the individual. We do a lot of projects together. He is a very, very close in real life IRL friend. But let me show you what we were doing because he is a genius, much, much smarter than me. And uh, I will be completely honest, you have to go ahead and uh, really respect folks that are doing their, some great stuff and they have their own technical prowess and their own skill sets and competencies. Not everyone, especially myself, is going to be good at everything. So I thought, hey, Caleb, do you think you might have anything to offer in this regard? I messaged him like, hey, have you used Speakeasy before? He's like, no, I haven't, but it looks super cool. And I said, it's really nice when it works. I've seen it do incredible stuff. I just like dump interpreter information and show what it's calling back and use the Win32 API call functions, etc. cetera. Um, sometimes I get an error though, and it doesn't work and I don't exactly know what I'm doing. So I was like, hey, if you aren't busy, <laughs> I gotta ask, 
I have this shell code that's defined in PowerShell, um, but it dies when I try to use it with Speakeasy. And I included a screenshot there. And he's like, oh, cool. All right. Hey, let me play with it. Just give me a moment. And then he, he used this bash to uh, remove all the comments and get the shell code out of it. A really cool one-liner. Same thing that he used to do. He, he's, he's, he loves those uh, one-liners, right? And I said, hey, just checking strings, this thing likely reads from a registry key. Maybe the invalid read that I keep seeing comes from just not having an emulated Windows registry to pull things from. And then I see, oh, he uses unhex, uh, which looks like a tool present in actually pwn tools. Let me showcase that. If I were to use unhex on right now, it's just gonna give me uh, an input prompt. But if I hit control C, you can see that it dies uh, trying to use Python's pwnlib and pwn tools. So that's gotta be, that's gotta be pwn tools. That's pretty slick. Probably the same as like xxd tack r tack p. Uh, to unhexlify something or decode it from the ba hex res representation, base 16. Slick, if you didn't know it, good, handy stuff. He says, uh, their Docker file seems to be broken, so I guess I'll mess with it. I didn't have uh, any issues trying to load up their Docker file. If you wanted to, um, you can move into Speakeasy, and then you'll notice that there is a Docker file present. Uh, you can Docker build, tack T, um, whatever you'd like to call this speak easy and then a period for the current directory and then you could docker run it and work with it um but whatever he tried to work with it just kind of installed on his own system like i had been doing previously it says that when it dies it seems to be searching for a string in memory uh 64616f4c which is load maybe it's trying to find load library already loaded into memory somewhere now i had mentioned that i was getting started looking at strings here so you can run strings if you're <laughs> leaked, obviously, you know strings is the most overpowered uh, tool here. Uh, and it shows some interesting things. And I, I will go on a tangent for a little bit if that's totally okay, looking at this, because just kind of as Caleb noticed, and I was kind of referring to, we could see segments of some strings that could be executed. Load library, uh, get proc address, virtual alloc and exit process kind of chunked up. So those are peculiar and interesting to me because obviously it's going to very likely do more things with more shellcode or, or executing something new, I, I have to think. I also see a reg open and then a potential reg key or query value um, odd and weird, right? But down below, I noticed that same registry key or had sort of hive location that we were looking at previously, RN, IV, TTQ, BRN. And this LPMF was some value that we saw in the registry file. Uh, I think I saved that in output.log, right? Yeah. So forgive me. I know this is disgusting to look at, but check out that value, LPMF, and the value that is included here is <laughs> all of this absolutely nonsense, disgusting stuff. <laughs> so maybe that's more shellcode. It, it's, it looks like it's encoded in some weird way. It's not all real bytes. Uh, it's not an MZ header to kind of act as another PE or portable executable or windows.exe or DLL. Uh, so I thought, well, okay, maybe this is something, maybe that's shellcode, but I don't know. If I try to carve that out, uh, would it actually be more shellcode that I could potentially work with Speakeasy or Ghidra? Um, with all that said, I was looking at these strings here, and I thought it's odd that they're kind of separated and chunked up um, with different delimiters or different pieces surrounding them. Obviously, it's not the full line load library. So I thought, let me just kind of poke at this thing with a hex editor. I'll use hex edit SC32. And then over on the right hand side, you can see the ASCII representation of some of these fragmented portions, right? Library, get proc. Uh, I think my face is in the way for just that one. Yeah. Uh, address, virtual lock, etc., etc. So scrolling through this, just trying to see if there was anything else weird in here, I saw this one peculiar thing. And of course, my face is absolutely in the way. So let me uh, show you how we could view that otherwise. Yeah, I think strings EL32 does it? Yeah, that's it. So strings tack EL makes it take the Unicode representation. Uh, let me check out strings, the man page here. Tack E encoding. 
pass in an argument here, select the character encoding of the strings that are to be found. Possible values for encoding are S, single seven bit characters, that's ASCII, etc. That's the default, as we just normally ran strings. Um, S, B, etc. Oh, this is it. L is 16 bit little endian. Useful for finding wide character strings. So we found that just knowing that magical incantation with strings, but realistically we could end up using something like floss to be able to track that down. Um, do I have Chrome open? I don't think I do. So floss GitHub, please. This is it. Just like Speakeasy, this is another FireEye utility. It is the uh, obfuscated string solver Basically strings, but just amped up to be able to look for static strings, advanced static string analysis, trying to find things that might be present on the stack, etc. cetera, um, trying to do other things, and also finding static UTF-16 strings. That's what, we were, that's what we were just examining. So if I were to literally run floss, which I have cloned and installed in my op directory, floss on SC32 will give us this static Unicode string. And that has an interesting syntax here. Shell, colon, colon, or uh, colon, colon, and then kind of arrow keys, or the greater than, less than symbols, waka waka, whatever you want to call them. A strange syntax here. And then I RM. So I didn't exactly know what that was, but it looked weird enough and unique enough to be something that maybe we could key off of and do some more digging and research. Because maybe that is one specific telltale that, could help us diagnose or really detect what this malware sample is. So with that said, I'd go back to Chrome and I'd try to Google that sort of thing. <laughs> and it gets some weird stuff trying to find shell gas stations nearby. Uh, I'll have to be sure to obscure that, blur that out. Um, and the other results that it sees here are ADB shell RM, how to remove file on Android using ADB, make RM move to trash, etc. Um, I'm going to assume that RM syntax up here is kind of making stuff weird. Let's Google that again without that. Uh, and that doesn't get anything worthwhile. Let's try and remove that RNIV portion. See if that does anything different. No. Part of me thinks the shell thing is going to be cut up. So let's try and just add double quotes around that to see if maybe uh, like it, searching for that literal string. And I have some weird thing here that returns. Uh, Covter uncovered. E. White Hats has done a deep dive analysis of Covter, a click fraud malware that was the number one source of new crimeware infections in May of 2018. So let's go ahead and take a look at what that thing might be. Looks like it's a PDF to download. I want to open this up here. And we have <laughs> Covter Uncovered, Malware Teardown. Maybe the sample that we're looking at is Covter here. Table of contents that kind of explains this sort of thing. Overview of Covter's behavior. And then here, what we're talking about. Abstract, E. White Hats is in a deep dive analysis on Covert. Click Fraud Malware, number one source of crime in May 2018. Uh, Covter's file list persistence technique, which exploits bugs in the Microsoft registry editor to write invisible keys to the registry is also discussed. Okay. So this originally I think had been found by a malicious word document or an embedded visual basic script, VBA, VB application, which downloaded malware from a C2 server. Click fraud malware. Is this what it will do once it executes? Probably. Before diving into the technical detail of how Cover operates, the section will explain the overall behavior of the malware. We'll walk through all of its behavior from when it first gains execution to when it begins click fraud activity. Covter uses several clever tricks to achieve fileless persistence on the machine infects. The machine performs a variant of common technique, adding a value to the registry key, HK current user, software Microsoft, Windows current virtual unit. That must be the actual auto run, the LNK file that we had tracked down to like kind of kickstart our investigation here. Uh, yeah, <laughs> this caused a two headache. Suspicious values in registry and the red key are often a red flag and location of the malware is exposed. Covder overcomes both of these obstacles by creating a registry value that is invisible to regedit and storing its malware executable in the registry. The hidden value in the run key is a short snippet of JavaScript, which is passed to the Microsoft HTML host, 
MSHTA as a command line argument. That script decodes the next layer, all of which is stored in the registry, instead of an executable on disk. Ooh, that sounds kind of like what we were looking at. The bot sends messages like resp bot okay to further mislead malware researches. That must be some communication once it actually has like its full payload unraveled, communicating with the command and control server C2. Huh. Okay. Using Chrome to be able to click on other things, using a modified version of Chrome. I'm not extremely interested in this. I kind of want to get into how this all kickstarts. Is this going to end up being the same malware sample that we were looking at? Oh, ooh, ooh, but the, the context strings it references here that looks like we're part of communicating with the C2, it does include that shell syntax that we just saw uh, used when a shell 32 shell code 32 or a c32 variable that we just saw loads covter causes covter to inject itself with into a new process with process hollowing Ooh. in order of preference the process it will use the hosts are reg server 32 explorer and run dll and the process covter is currently running in crazy let's see configuration data in the resource segment uh, this must be what the shell code is trying to execute out, SC32. I'm assuming. It's responsible for parsing the PE resource segment. After the data is base64 decoded, a 16-byte XOR key is pulled down from the data which is used to decode the rest of the buffer as seen in the following algorithm. Uh, XOR, which would be in the PE file, I think, if I'm reading that super quickly. I don't think I need to dig into all that. Oh, ooh, 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 configuration data and registry. This looks like, this looks identical to what we would have seen had we opened that thing in registry because of these strange variable names. The screenshot above showcases an example of Covter's registry configuration data. The random looking names are the result of a name generation algorithm Covter uses not only for registry names, but also for naming files that it would write to disk. While the names appear random, they're actually deterministically generated. Each value above starts as a clear text seed string that is salted with values from the infected computer, such as the computer name. The campaign key is also used as a salt. In the above screenshot, the key containing the rest of its values is IIID. This is generated by the function generate unique computer name and is referred to the unique computer name elsewhere in the paper. Oh. Oh. That, I'm going to assume is, is that... Would that be our LPMF equivalents or where we found this original thing? Um, um, scrolling around registry values. There are some tricks here. I didn't see any plain text user agent, not going to lie, but this might be a new variant or something. I think Covter was doing some Jupiter tricks or Jupiter was doing some Covter tricks. I don't exactly uh, remember which one it was, but. Though many IP addresses are stored in the registry in Covter's resource segment, most of the addresses are not legitimate C2 addresses. The address of the actual C2 is stored in reg value 32. This registry value contains a domain list, so the address in this list are stored with the prefix HTTP. All communication with the C2 over, occur over SSL using port 443. Understood. Hmm. Let me see what JavaScript you guys see. Let me see what you had found to showcase this. Do you Are you not going to show me? No? Well, this is a very cool graph here. I, I don't mean to completely score right by it, but update executable context things runs MSHTA does all this process hollowing double loader regular pe loader that's crazy that's a very cool uh graph you guys have what else we got fileless persistence in this appendix we'll discuss coveters fileless persistence technique the techniques that allow it to take advantage of weaknesses and registry to create invisible things Ooh, ooh, this this 
screenshot showcases it. MSHDA JavaScript random value set to random string, something set to a new object of WSH WScript.shell, and then reg read HKCU software random thing, random thing, and eval it. That's exactly what we were just seeing. Large hex string is XOR decoded and passed to a second JavaScript eval function. Meaningless JavaScript variables are created and intermixed with the XOR decode algorithm. We literally saw that exact same thing as well. Okay. Stage three, base64 string is decoded and passed as an environment variable to PowerShell, which calls IEX or invoke expression on it. Again, literally saw that. Two functions are defined, gdelegate and gproc. Exact same. These resolve virtual alloc, allocate a read write executable buffer, and copy a byte array called sc32 into the, and then create thread passes control to the buffer and executes it. Wow. Again, identical to what we're seeing. So I think without a doubt, we can pretty confidently say, look, this is Covter. Um, explaining all of this, they do reference an LNK file, which would be what we had tracked down. They also saw a bat file in their case or a specific extension to be able to then run and execute the spooky actual Covter payload. This is their batch script syntax. Um, that wasn't one that we had seen, but that it, it ends up creating what it sounds like a handler for that specific random file extension. The start command uses the default handler of the file extension to run this file, but the malware would install a default handler for that file extension, and it'll add that in hkey class root. Um, I don't, that's not going to be present in our own registry, like hive that we got from endusers.dat, but I wonder if it is on the host, on the target. And you can see the JavaScript syntax with MSHTA. Blah, blah, blah. I think I'm beating the dead horse on this. I've been doing this for a while. But seriously look at how identical all of this is. Uh, and it is exactly what we were up against. This truly is Covter. We can see all the same tradecraft techniques and real syntax here. Uh, I'll scroll through this a little bit more just to see. Yep, yep. Gdelegate, sleep for 15 seconds. All of the Win32 functions to being able to be pulled in. SC32 bytes with the comments, <laughs> just as it found. And, oh, this explains it a little bit more. PowerShell script has a large byte array called SC32. The script allocates a buffer of RWX memory. Uh, S32 can be extracted from the script. Strings like byte intermix array are comments, put there as obfuscation. Took me a while to realize that. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Once the shellcode blob is extracted to be analyzed with Ida, Ghidra, or whatever. Yep. Shellcode reads a registry value, just as we thought. It's a buffer containing the Covter PE file encoded with an XOR key. The key is baked into the data section of SC32. Uh, so that must do some XOR because the data that we saw, all this is just too messy. Not gonna lie. That's not something that I think we'd very easily be able to be pulled out. Uh, at the time Covter persists itself, a random string no longer than 32 bytes long and at least 16 bytes long is generated. Covter is encoded and that string uses XOR decode string 2. The key is burned and embedded into SC32 and the cov encoded Covter is written to that registry value. Covter is loaded in the same address space as the shell code. We're still executing in the context of PowerShell. SC32 uses the Covter PE loader with the double size allocation so the Covter PE and context string can be written as rel. Excuse me, the string shell, shell RM, and then the unique computer name identifier, NKEX, in their example, is used. And that must do the process hollowing technique. When giantinit sees the shell context string, it uses the context string power and does process hollowing to inject into another process. The sleep in PowerShell script from the third stage, that's that 15 second sleep, that allows us to see PowerShell terminate and expire but the power context string causes the process to act as the main covter process. That's insane. Uh, it talks about the invisible registry tricks, talks about conventional persistence, but using HK current user is a little bit of a trick. That's why we were hump jumping over hoops and hurdles with the uh, nt user .dat stuff and other things. But 
yeah, trying to access some of those who just wouldn't be displayed in the registry if you're looking for the original auto run in the LNK file. Very slick, very cool, very spooky, good malware tricks. And Covder, I think, has a lot of uh, tricks up their sleeve. All right, uh, I've been scrolling through this for forever, but now that we know that this is Covter, we could do some Covter malware analysis uh, and maybe do a little bit of other reading. And you can see that I've went around and just tried to uncover what else is described here, what else is showcased. Trend Micro has some info. Again, this is previous research, right? Back in 2017. Um, let's see if this explains a little bit more. App data, app data recovery and that is the end of that article that's not all that helpful i would like a technical analysis uh can i go back to google please malware analysis how about that here's one this is a malware bytes blog perch has some good stuff analysis of viper uh quick heal that's another pdf cdn hubspot there's a lot that we could come from this. This is Malwarebytes Lab. Covder is a click fraud malware famous <laughs> in everything that we've already read. They work through a couple samples. They showcase a lot of this stuff, MSHCA to run PowerShell, et cetera, et cetera. Trying to unpack and extract some of the stuff up. Okay, they're using a debugger to analyze these. You can see the PE file that we would end up carving out. Um, it breaks for them just as well. Is it packed or something? Persistence talks about the invisible run keys. You can still see it with auto runs. The batch file, the persistent file handler that they've set, the original MSHTA one, how it would look in registry. I'm cruising through this because I want to see some other uh, new particular tricks. They, or how they might have figured out how to carve out the PE file from the shellcode. It sounds like that SC32 is position independent shellcode. Content is loaded into a newly allocated memory page and executed a new thread. You can see it, and they examine it in their debugger. Every shellcode must be self sufficient in loading all the required imports. For this purpose, this one uses a trick. Uh, I scrolled through that, sorry. What, what, what? Did I jump past it? Yeah. Uh, they use a trick known from the reflective loader and shell codes generated by Metasploit. Okay. At the beginning of the execution, it tries to get the handle of kernel 32. To achieve this goal, it enumerates all the loaded modules, calculates checksums of their names, and compares them with the hard-coded checksum value. Ah. That it uses checksums to get handles of the functions inside of kernel 32.dll. With their help, it loads other necessary modules and functions, i.e. ADV API. Uh, I, part of me is curious how that might... Oh, yeah, yeah. Because that's how we would need to get the registry open keys and reg query. It needs to pull them in from ADV API 32.dll. Uh, using the checksum functionality and being able to get like a unique identifier for each of those is actually what they showcase and teach in OSED, the Offensive Security Exploit Developer. When you're handcrafting and writing your own shellcode from scratch, you do this exact process. You generate um, your own position independent shellcode with the techniques from the reflective loader that Metasploit uses. Uh, kind of a neat thing if you're into that. They try to export it, they try to get it. Uh, the value that's stored in the registry and read in the memory and decrypted, and the encryption key is random, newly generated on each one of the installers. So it's going to be specific to our own instance of Covter. Turns out to be a PE file that was loaded before, and then you could work through and extract it. It doesn't explain a little bit more, uh, because how is it decrypting that? How is it showcasing that? Here's another article. I want to get a better feel for how it might extract that PE file from that big registry. Ooh. All strings are kept in a structured encrypted form. The string is decrypted whenever required and erased from memory after use. For string decryption, Covder uses RC4. That's new Intel. Um, because originally I think we were thinking it's XOR. 
All encrypted strings are kept in a control section in the following format. Below is a snippet of an encrypted string structure. So they have a separator with FFF, F, 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 F. <laughs> and then a keyword and a key and another separator. Maybe we could see that present in our shellcode. Encrypted key or the key is generally three bytes long. For each string, the key is different. The key is used to decrypt the corresponding one. And then they analyze some of the network traffic. Oh, and you can see the click fraud here that they use trying to click on advertisements. Configuration. This would be a very cool one to look through just as well. Oh, and there's their config file. You can see all the different potential domains. Wow. Wow. So, um, with that said, let's kind of go back to what we were discussing with Caleb. Uh, and I'll, I'll pivot back to this. He's smarter than me, right? And he opens this thing up in Ghidra. And he says, looking at this code in Ghidra, it appears to manually resolve the addresses of load library and other things, and then uses them to load ADV I, yeah, API. Um, that makes sense because it said it mucks with the registry. Yep, we've, we've, we've processed that. It doesn't get that far though in our speakeasy emulator. It fails while trying to dynamically or manually resolve the initial methods it needs. And I said, look, I see all of these live library, get proc address, et cetera, et cetera. And it tries to read out this key in registry, that LPMF. I don't know if that's a binary or not or more shell code. And then Caleb is still trying to reverse engineer it and work through it. He says, hey, it's getting more readable, but it looks like what we're going to end up seeing in that registry key is more shell code, maybe. And I say, well, what I see in the registry, LPMF, doesn't have the usual MZ header. So it's not a regular PE or Windows executable or DLL. I think it's more shell code. It's just humongous. He said, yeah, yeah, I wouldn't expect it to. Loading an actual PE file from memory is not only difficult, but also excessive. Uh, as we come to find out, and I think we see, it is in fact literally a full, full-blown PE file and executable. Uh, I can see it allocating the space for and loading the data in from one of two registry keys. If one fails, it tries another, but I can't. I haven't figured out how it uses it yet. And then I said the supposed shell code that was present in LPMF gets nothing out of Speakeasy. I tried to carve it out. Uh, is there anything in the shell code that uses? It looks like it might do some XOR. That's what I was thinking. Is it encrypted or is it encoded, quote unquote, encrypted in some way? And as we were just doing our own research just now, we've come to think, okay, it could be XOR. It could be RC4. Uh, there are a lot of other random values that are in the registry. So I was wondering if any of those are a key when we saw some of the smaller ones. Like, let me look for value equals. Uh, here is the original code that we saw, BK, QQ, HY, et cetera. But searching for other values, there's one SDET, which is tiny. Maybe that's a key. TGBU, may, maybe that's a key, et cetera. Maybe that's a key. Uh, can I set syntax highlighting on this, please? Sort of. Okay. Uh, now word wrap is going to blow stuff up. But I started to mess with some of these and base 6040 code them and try and encrypt or decrypt with XOR with that as a key. Didn't really get anywhere. Uh, I'm just a fool. <laughs> not open this thing, not opening this thing up in, in Ghidra, but whatever. I don't, I don't care publicly be making a fool of myself. Caleb says, look, there's definitely something going on that's doing the XOR or some sort of encrypting or decrypting, but he hasn't gotten through it yet. And then I shared with him that Covter white paper that I had found in the moment. And he says, that sounds like what I'm looking at. Surprisingly, they chose to dynamically link a full executable or PE file at runtime, and that's a pain. I said it would be cool to try and dig out the XOR key and unravel the full PE. And he says, this is probably the loop that does it, but following those memory references backwards would be hell and really annoying. It says the key isn't directly in the binary. It starts off as range 256 and then is mutated at runtime to produce the final key. And I was thinking, is it stored in registry? Kind of as part of the persistence? There are those few short strings that might be candidates. And I try to copy and paste that there. He says, the shellcode appears to dynamically generate the key, but I'm not done. So one of those might be used as part of the stuff. Maybe one of those registry keys really is, but it generates the initial range at a specific variable and then mutates it with the data in another variable. But he can't figure out where that second one is initialized from. Eventually he says, hey, I found the data, but I'm getting an index error when trying to generate the key. And I was like, are you working in Python now? He's like, yeah, 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 yeah. So this implementation, that loop that I'm showing you looks like this in Python. 
Um, we could grab the values or variables that he would have situated, and this is going to essentially be the same algorithm that Covter would use to, to grab or, or get the key there and decrypt things as needed. Uh, and then eventually he's like, oh, actually, I realized my mistake. One second, I'm good now. Uh, why did you show that window? <laughs> uh, he says, did you already have the registry key extracted? I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I pulled it out from reading of the research. I'm not sure if it's XOR encrypted or RC4 encrypted. And I'll go ahead and send you the blob. And this is really cool. Caleb says, now that I'm looking at the Python code that I wrote, I'm pretty sure it's RC4 which is really just a fancy rotating XOR. So I showed him the code that I had used to carve this out. Uh, this was, again, using RegiPy as we had previously. Um, I grab the LPMF value and then I just write it uh, and I encrypt it as, or not encrypted is totally not the right word. I encode it as bytes with UTF-8. And now I have that, that binary. I think UTF-8 is the right encoding here. What the registry included was a ton of non-ASCII characters, obviously, because it's, encrypted with RC4, but I'm not sure if I'm re-representing that data that right. And I was like, did you get a key? <laughs> and then he just sends me an executable file and it, it, the work is done. Caleb has done it all. The genius. I says, I'm surprised Slack let me upload that here. I'm surprised Defender didn't trigger on that for me in all honesty. I say, how did you crank out the key? He said, what I identified as the unknown seed was the RC4 passphrase. What I was reversing was the key generation algorithm for RC4. After I reversed it and rewrote the block in Python, I realized that it was very similar to the RC4 key generation in decryption routines. There was a bug somewhere in my accidental code, like what he was trying to write. So on a hunch, I just thought, hey, let's throw it into a real RC4 decryptor that has properly implemented this uh, with the unknown seed value as the key, and it worked. So there he has the key. Now, my home-ruled bug-riddled RC4 implementation gives us that, in his code, but I'm saying, how did you track down that unknown seed value? What was that? This is the RC4 key scheduling algorithm, the variable unknown seed that I obviously named. It's a stack local variable, but I cross-referenced it to find where it was assigned, and I found the second picture. I had to figure out that the function being called was memcopy, because it's an indirect call to another part of the shellcode, which implements a crude memcopy routine. So putting in and placing shellcode, right? From there, I knew the key was at key name at that offset, and the actual key length was in key name at that offset, which are both memory references into the shellcode blob itself, so he was able to extract those values and then pull things out. Very, very cool, very slick. Um, the last part of the shellcode is just doing the dynamic linking required to load a PE file without consulting the kernel. It has the entire PE file itself in memory, so it has to go through and load all of the required DLLs referenced in the PE, resolve the requested functions from those DLLs, and then patch the PE file in memory. In the end, it just calls the entry point. This is the same thing that the kernel would do when you call create process on its own, but they do it manually. So it doesn't create a new process. It just takes over this one and it isn't logged as a quote unquote new process. I commented this and it was like, that is exactly process hollowing. That is, the, that is, that is process hollowing. That's cool. Kind of crazy to see that. What language did you tell Ghidra the shellcode file is to open and get a pseudo decompile display? I tried to pry it open, but didn't have to write out the code on the right side. Um, yeah. So a couple things, Ghidra won't decompile arbitrary assembly. It is shellcode, right? It decompiles functions. If you loaded the PE file with any x86 language, it would show up. If it doesn't decode a disassembly, if it doesn't show a disassembly immediately, you can just right click an address that contains an instruction and then tell it to disassemble. That'll give you a disassembly, but no functions to decompile. If you know something is a function, right click on that first address and click create function. It'll create a new function there and should kick off the decompilation process. Secondly, because this code is for Windows, you need to select the Visual Studio option. If you don't, the calling conventions will be wrong and the function calls will look super weird. It's like, this is super cool. Thanks so much for helping me out, dude. Um, I think this is cool and uh, let's let's showcase this a little bit. So he's like, hey, no problem. This was an interesting rabbit hole. With that said, I have this stuff that I could show you. Um, let's try to fire up Ghidra just to I could show you kind of what I was getting at in that last segment there. And I know this is becoming an egregiously long video and I apologize for that, but hopefully we'll have some pretty cool stuff in here. I have this SC32 file that I had loaded into the project. Um, and if you actually were to load it up without it, it will prompt you for the library and you'll have to select, or the language, and you'll supply x86 
uh, and then, as Caleb mentioned, Visual Studio. Now, hopping over to the functions segment or checking out strings, which we could see present, clicking on the functions will actually let this, like being the first one, show a little bit of a decompilation. And then we just kind of have to figure it all out though which gets a little bit of a mess. Uh, but you could potentially see some of the same processes that we were seeing earlier um, that Caleb was showcasing and the hex strings that will represent those, those fragments of load library. When you saw just load or library or airy, uh, all those are cut up in their own hexadecimal representation. So it's not stored strictly in the binary. Very cool, very slick. Uh, I won't go into that uh, witchcraft at the moment, but let me show you that binary that we have uncovered here. Uh, I try to chunk things up when I try to experiment things with different keys. I pulled out that encrypted one. And I think I actually got that from experiment.py. Uh, I could show you that Python code still present here. Yeah. I just carved this out with that same syntax you saw earlier. And then, like I mentioned, I was trying to carve out some of the keys <laughs> on a hunch, hoping that they might be it, but they were not. Um, we do have, however, this LPMF covter.exe, which is an MS-DOS executable, MZ for MS-DOS. Now, if I were to again run floss on this sort of thing, let's try and pipe that to less. Program must be run under Win32 or W32. Because it's MS-DOS, it does a strange thing. Uh, so scrolling through some of these here, you can again see pieces to be able to use the Borland compiler. I'm assuming this is going to be a fragment of Delphi. Uh, we could open this up in Ghidra if we really wanted to. Uh, there are other things that could reference here, and I want to get to some of the unique, interesting ones. Yeah, Delphi, etc. I'm going to keep scrolling until I can find something peculiar for us. Because a lot of those bot commands, like the... Uh, articles that we were reading in the previous research that we were checking out, it looks like you could see those straight bot commands written in. And the user agent actually now baked into the pure original covter value or, or executable. Just, again, fragments and portions and pieces of it, but enough to give us the telltale and breadcrumb. Like, oh, that's like there. <laughs> you can see the post requests get. I was really hoping we might be able to track down one of the IP addresses, but again, that's in registry. Uh, with the key that we have, part of me wonders if we would be able to retrieve that now um, and see what C2 servers that might be using. Or I don't know if it's going to end up being a different key because it said sometimes the key is different for each thing that it's trying to encrypt or decrypt. Uh, maybe we could get Caleb back in the party with us and see if he can jam and crank out the other one. Um, but you can see the portions of the previous JavaScript and PowerShell things that we would have seen, how it used to set up its own persistence. Crazy. Um, putting all these in different registry keys, etc. These are all just fragments again, but let me see if I can find one of those colon colons to uh, showcase some of the bot commands that it might run and execute with the command and control server. I'm trying to load kernel 32, etc. Ooh, fingerprinting, Windows server, different things. I don't mean to uh, to delay and, and badger this thing. I know this might not be all that interesting. Um, let's kind of see if we can get any indicators of like power colon or any, any colons that might help us find something that looks like one of the C2 calls. Connection, close, content length, no, no. Maybe I'm not going to readily see one. And there's a lot in here, so that could be hunting for a while. And again, we are just literally looking through strings. Not all that interesting, though. So let's let's bail on that. You can fire that open in Ghidra. You can crack it open. Uh, you'll notice, or, or what, remember when I was chatting with Caleb, Caleb was kind of surprised. I'm surprised Slack let me see that. I'm also surprised when I tried to download it, I was working at my host, and Windows Defender didn't care. So... Is this executable in itself something that maybe would, would, would have some issues here? Uh, how does that look in something like Virus Total? So let's fire up Virus Total and let's see what we have. If I were to upload, 
We could upload our shell code. Let's start with that. Uh, there's probably no way that it would find anything weird. I'm not exactly positive. Um, I really doubt that it would because it's just straight shell code. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, hey, ESET's like, hey, that's Covder. <laughs> nice, ESET. ESET always gets it. ESET's pretty strong. Um, with that said, I did, I just for the sake of curiosity, Nice. He said the only one that tracked it down. Uh, I, I did try to upload this previously, uh, the Covter executable that Caleb had, because this has been a few days, right? Like I said. So Gambit was the only one that uncovered it, but he didn't know strictly that it was Covter. He just said unsafe AI score. Um, can I rescan, reanalyze this file? Because it's been a few days, right? Now Virus Total might have passed it to uh, other vendors because Virus Total has to do that. Um, we're one out of 37, one out of 57, one out of 58. I don't know. Surprised that ESET finds the loader, but doesn't seem to track down this MS-DOS file on its own. So no, still now a couple days later with one occurrence out of 60, Defender let the thing cruise right on by. So I never want to execute that, but I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> obviously all of this is just an exploratory thing. Uh, I don't mean to speak with any certainty, but it's been kind of fun to explore and dig into this thing. Covter was very, very fun to walk through from that initial persistence, carving through MSHTA to JavaScript and then PowerShell to uh, looking at the shell code. It looks like it has kind of carried itself around in different ways between macros that are being used to infect other machines or phishing emails, right, of course, um, VBA scripts, etc. There's been a lot of cool research research on this and Covder's been doing some weird peculiar stuff even back as 2017 2018 uh, I would encourage you if you're interested go do some of that research go explore go look around see what you're interested in um, but there's a lot of good stuff out here so yeah <laughs> that's it I am poured out at this point I've been talking for a long long time and I hope this has been a I know it's been a crazy long video, but I hope there's been some cool, good uh, learning lessons in that. So thank you so, so much for watching, everybody. Thank you for putting up with the time travel between the few days ago when I started recording this and now when I'm trying to finish it up. Uh, the editing might look weird. Maybe my maybe ent my enthusiasm and energy is different. I don't even know. But uh, thank you again and again. Please do those YouTube algorithm things. If you could like the video, leave a comment and subscribe. I would be super duper grateful. Hey, I am trying to boost up my Twitch account. I'm starting to stream these days very, very late at night, probably like midnight Eastern time uh, that might depending on your time zone help you out depending on what time but trying to do it also trying to amp up twitter trying to amp up all the socials would love if you'd be willing to come uh, hang out and, and track me down on those <laughs> those platforms hey uh, i'm going to include a shout out in this video for the sneak uh capture the flag and conference coming up in october you should absolutely go play please do it and uh, i'll see you there and i'll see you in the next video everybody thanks so much for watching i love you i'll see you later with the with the